What's up guys? So it was about a year ago now that I traveled to the beautiful city of Paris and finally got my hands on a real French croissant. And without a doubt, it was by far the best one I've ever had. Flaky, buttery, rich, it had it all. I tried a few good croissants back home after that, but nothing ever got close. Which in my world means exactly one thing, I gotta learn to make them myself. So in this video, I'll take you along for the ride as I make the very first batch of homemade croissants in my life, which I think turned out pretty legit with a little bit of help from somebody who knows a thing or two about them. There are croissants everywhere out there. I just don't eat them. I eat specific ones. I can't just have a bad croissant. But aside from being a great culinary skill, definitely worth learning, the other reason I really wanted to make a video about croissants is that they have a fascinating history. Or so I thought. Look, legend has it that the croissant's history goes back to the 17th century, when the Ottoman Empire tried to take over the city of Vienna in what's known as the Great Turkish War. The Ottoman army was very powerful, but the city of Vienna was standing strong in large part thanks to their city walls. And so the Ottomans came up with a sneaky idea. One day, in the darkness of the night, while the city of Vienna was asleep, they would secretly send a few people up to the city walls to dig tunnels under them, so they could then basically sucker punch the Viennese before they woke up in the morning and thus take over the city. So they start digging and digging, but there was one thing they didn't consider, and that's the Viennese people's love for bread. Since bread was the number one staple food back in the day, the city had lots and lots of bakers. And to provide the people with their breakfast loaves in time, these bakers would get up extremely early, or more like they would start working the night before. And this one night, they heard some highly unusual sounds coming from outside the city walls and even from beneath them. So they ran over to the city's guards and alarmed them, who, thanks to the bakers, were able to fight off the Ottomans and defend the city. To celebrate the big victory and their part in it, the Viennese bakers decided to come up with a new type of bread roll called the Kipfel, which was symbolically shaped like the moon that you would find on the battle flags of the Ottoman Empire. Empire. The Viennese people did not just win this one battle, they actually ended up winning the entire war and the Kipfel became a new tradition. So much so that a young Austrian-born princess named Marie Antoinette brought it to France. Yes, that's right, we're talking about that Marie Antoinette, the last queen of France before the revolution, the Kim Kardashian of the 18th century, who was actually born and grew up in Vienna, where she presumably ate lots and lots of Kipfel before she married some French dude and moved to Paris. At some point, she started missing her hometown comfort food, so she ordered the bakers in Paris to recreate it. They, of course, said, Bien sûr, but they also decided to fancy it up with this cool new technique they discovered called puff pastry. Oh, French people. They decided to name their new creation after its shape, which resembled a crescent, as in crescent moon, and that of course in French means, you guessed it, Croissant. What a neat and beautiful story, isn't it? In fact, it's such a nice story that I keep hearing about it on TV shows, on podcasts, I keep reading versions of it in tons of magazine articles over and over, but unfortunately, most of it is complete bullshit. Let me explain. So the Viennese Kipfel, yes, that's actually a thing. And don't mix it up with the Kipfel, which is also a crescent-shaped pastry, but that's more of a cookie. Anyhow, the Kipfel, yes, it's definitely much older than the French croissant, and indeed it does appear to be sort of its granddaddy. The thing is, it's so much older than the croissant that it actually predates the Ottoman siege of Vienna by a good couple hundred of years. The Austrian government is quite good at preserving the country's baking heritage and they have done some research dating evidence of crescent moon-shaped pastry in the region all the way back to the 13th century. And you know, technically the story with the heroic bakers could still partially be true, but there's one major problem. The first documented occurrence of this legend only dates back to the 1938 issue of La Rousse Gastronomique, which confusingly even says all of this 
happened in Budapest for some reason. And this book is one of the classics of French culinary literature. It's been updated and reissued many, many times and it still carries this story to this day, which of course explains how it got so popular. And if you're saying, well, it's a classic, it can't be wrong, then, you know, think again, because this is also the classic that taught everybody that searing meat seals in the juices in a steak, which is, you know, scientifically proven to just be bullshit as well so you know either way there's absolutely no legitimate record of the bakers actually saving vienna before the publishing of this book and where they got the story from is probably the real mystery here and sadly same goes for the part of the story in which marie antoinette sparks the invention of the croissant because if she did then somehow everybody back then seems to have missed the story which in the case of such a huge celebrity seems let's say quite unlikely. So how about this? Let's actually talk about what we do know. We already established that people in Vienna were eating crescent shaped baked goods like almost a thousand years back. What's also well documented is that the Viennese style of baking has been highly respected in France ever since the 19th century. In fact, it would actually become the origin of the term viennoiserie, which is the big category that includes enriched baked goods like the croissant, the brioche, and many more. And the beginning of this now almost two century long food hype can actually be traced back to 1838, when a Viennese entrepreneur called August Zang tried his luck and opened a new bakery in Paris. He was among the very first few people who introduced the steam injection oven to the city, you know, allowing Parisians to finally taste the delicate flavors of viennoiserie. And those, of course, included his version of the Austrian classic, the Kipfel. And good old August struck gold with this. Like his bakery became one of the hottest places in all of Paris for a number of years. And so of course, local bakers would copy and adapt his innovations. And one of their innovations on top of his innovation was making Kipfel with puff pastry. Puff pastry in its modern form has definitely been around in Paris back then and we know that because it's actually been listed as a technique in Le Patissier Francois even 200 years before August Tsang even opened his bakery. And so somewhere in the 1840s the puff pastry Kipfel, the newly named croissant, appears and goes viral. You can easily find it mentioned in Charles Dickens' travel diaries from 1859 and then many, many more times after that. And so next time you hear the story of how the croissant is actually the Ottoman flag and Marie Antoinette brought it from Vienna to Paris, probably not. I'm sorry. I know it's a good story, but probably not. And while I was researching the story, I kept thinking, does the fact that a Viennese person sparked the invention of the croissant make it less French? And you know what? I really don't think so. So many iconic foods on this planet have been influenced by another culture at some point or another. And what matters the most, I think, is what the newly created food, what type of position it assumes in its new home. And when it comes to croissants in France, well, you know what, let's call up a French guy and ask him what he thinks of them. I grew up with them. Croissant is not a thing I would eat on a daily basis. This is something I would have on the weekends. Or for birthday, my family would wake me up with like a song and, and a few croissants. <laughs> I've got very fond memories of croissants. Okay, I believe for viewers of my channel, this guy needs no introduction. But you know, just in case, this is Alex, also known as French Guy Cooking. For many years, he's been making some of the most fun and creative food videos on YouTube. And he recently dedicated an entire series to the one and only croissant, where he learned from the master bakers of Paris, designed custom machines to get the dough right and stopped just short of milking the cows to get perfect butter. I think it's safe to say Alex is a pretty good person to guide me through my very first homemade croissant experience. First of all, what is your experience with croissant? Zero. Literally zero. zero. Mm -hmm. Shaping the croissant, it's not rocket science. Brushing the croissant, it's not rocket science. Baking the croissant, same. Making the dough at first, it's just mixing. Problem lies within the layers. How to have properly, evenly distributed layers. Croissants were very intimidating to me. It's not that hard. I think it's doable. If, if, you, if you commit to it, I think it's doable. I tend to set up my expectations too high, always, which means that I'm always disappointed. 
Yeah. I don't know. I think making good croissant at home, it's buttery, it's crispy. It's going to be baked in the oven. Even with a weird shape, they're going to taste good. That's all I needed to hear. So let's go get lots and lots of butter and get to work. So I have eight steps in front of me. That That's how usually I make a croissant. First of all, you make a sweetened bread dough and then you proof it and chill it. Milk yeah. or water? In, in my recipe, I went half, half. Okay. Flour, bit of milk, bit of water, bit of sugar, bit of salt, bit of yeast. But some yeah. milk is definitely the traditional way to go. Yes, because it, it gives a, a, bit, a bit more softness, a bit more richness in the end. Perfect. If you were to lack any richness with all the butter, <laughs> just add a bit of milk. So this is pretty much a standard yeasted dough. And like any yeasted dough, you want to give it a full first proof until it has at least doubled in size. It's probably going to take around one hour. Just make sure it's nice and puffy before you flatten and roll it out. Try making it as rectangular as possible because that will help you in the next step, which is to wrap the dough in bacon paper like this so you can then carefully squeeze it into an even rectangle with a rolling pin. Now this has got to go into the fridge and rest at least one full hour but ideally overnight. It's gonna feel quite floppy so I used a pizza peel to pick it up which turned out to be the absolutely perfect tool for the job actually. In the meantime that's step two you prepare the butter basically you just have to flatten it out. All the dimensions are important. The square of butter the size of it it's important related to how much dough you've got. That's actually a very important point and the only really tricky part about making croissants, I think. Let me show you what happens next and you'll understand. The way I do it, I make a big square out of dough. I place it in front, in front of me like a diamond. And then I place the, the, the square slab of butter in the center as a square, not as a diamond. And then I fold the edges. Bam, 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 bam. Oh, like an envelope. Yeah, like an envelope. Perfect. Exactly. Okay. And this is exactly why ideally you want to sketch out the size of the butter square on your dough wrapper. Make note of the measurements and then make sure you get a perfectly sized piece of butter. Being precise here is going to make your life a whole lot easier. And then you've got folds. This is the part where you need to be thorough. You need not to forget anything because you need to do one double fold and one single fold. This one, believe me, it sounds a lot more difficult than it actually is. You just have to follow the right steps. This process is called lamination and it's what creates the layers that make croissants so special. Butter will keep the layers of dough separated. And with each fold, the number of layers will multiply exponentially. Sorry, I'm terrible at maths, but a lot, a lot. For the traditional first fold, you roll out your dough evenly, then fold both ends inward so they meet not quite at the middle, and then you fold the dough again to make it a double fold. Then you roll out the dough a second time, keeping the exposed folds from before as the short sides, and then this time you fold one end in and then the other end over it like a letter. But one does not simply make two croissant dough folds in a row. And you rest the dough in between each fold? Yes, every time. Resting time is completely underrated. The dough just relaxes. But resting your dough in the fridge is not just about resetting elasticity. It's also about the invisible secret ingredient in croissants, which is temperature. If the butter is too warm, it's going to melt, it's going to squish on the edges, it's going to get out. So you need to get this right. But if, if, if the temperature is, is too low, the butter is going to be a slab of stone yeah. and you're not going to be able to flatten it out. And when you push it harder, you break it. That's right. And after you've done both of your folds, your dough will actually have to go back in the fridge for one final rest. And that one can take anywhere from, you know, an hour up to more than a day. The master baker in, in, in Paris, they take three days to make their croissants 100% for flavor development. They rise everything slowly in the fridge instead of rising them at room temperature or in a proofing chamber or in a proofing room. Well, since this was my very first batch of croissants, I decided to just go for the minimum amount of resting time, which is until the dough is firm, but not hard. You don't want to work on hard dough. If you rest it for longer, you want to let it get to, you know, a slightly warmer temperature for a little bit. Once your dough has all the fold and it's rested and it's cold it's time to cut it in pieces basically some sort of long pizza slices and then comes my personal favorite part of the process rolling the you know sort of pizza slices into croissants this is kind of where all of that work comes together the real last resting time happens when the croissant is shaped Oh, okay, so that's, that's post, the big one. Post shaping. Okay, so you have basically yeah, 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 have the, the, big the one. final unbaked croissant. You give that one a yes. final proof. You brush it with an egg wash, mm -hmm. and then you let it proof. The best 
is not to use a brush, but to use a paint gun, like a, a, a spray. Yeah, yeah. Because the dough is so fragile. All the layers are so thin. When you use a brush, you, you, you puncture the dough. It's going to be nice and fluffy just before going in the oven. And before going in the oven, you, you add a second layer of egg wash. Wow, that was a piece of work. And you know, while these might not be the prettiest croissants in the world, if you could only smell my studio right now, you would know this is next level stuff. If you check out the layers though, oh my God, absolutely unreal. Trust me, I am so about to eat these in a few seconds. And that actually brings me to the last question I asked Alex about croissants. After I bake my croissant, I think the, one of the most important questions is how do I eat it? How do you eat your croissant? Simply, you just dive into it. My, my favorite piece is the ear. Mm. So the very ends of the croissant because they are the crispiest. Mm. I, I, I could dip it in, in coffee. Mm doesn't matter if it's a good croissant it's gonna be fine i that's not usually something i do mm -hmm. but i wouldn't be mad at someone if they were to eat it in one way or another if you stuff it however hold on a second <laughs> not not that it's easy coming, it's coming it's coming because i saw someone i was at a wedding and they were like uh, people let's not mention them they were stuffing their croissant with cheese so i'm fine with this with ham okay okay S still fine with it but then the person also added nutella and it was a blasphemy wait, wait, wait. But it's at, the just a dish. at the same time yeah. What? yeah and they told me well everything goes in your belly you know that stupid response that you get when somebody eats something really disgusting <laughs> there is a line hmm. there is a line there is a line yeah and that person definitely crossed that line i think now i know not everyone can have the luxury of being guided by a world-renowned croissant expert on his very first attempt so Thanks a million to Alex for being part of this video. You guys should absolutely go over to his channel and check out his new series that he's about to drop and probably has dropped by the time you see the video. But if there's one thing we were able to show you, I hope it's that it's completely possible to make amazing croissants on your very first try. With that being said, thanks for watching. I'm looking forward to your croissant pictures and I'll see you in the next one.